Hey, it's David, and you're listening to the Tone Bass Classical Guitar Podcast. Got Adam Del Monte, extraordinary flamenco guitarist for today's episode. Killer player and masterful composer. He's got a really interesting musical upbringing, and um, he recently completed writing the very first flamenco opera ever to be written. So you're going to hear an in-depth conversation on the story behind this piece along with the orchestration. If you haven't heard, I'm sorry to bring sad news. We tragically lost uh, an amazing young player this week, Sabrina Vlaskalik. I never uh, had the pleasure to meet her, but I was always really impressed by her recordings. And everyone I've spoken to um, remembers her for being such a kind, caring, um, and passionate person, musician, teacher. And... Um, as I said, it's um, it's incredibly sad. I send my deepest condolences uh, to all of her friends and family. So I'm going to do things a little differently today um, for our listening samples. Uh, in tribute to Sabrina, we're going to take a lesson to one of her recordings, and then uh, one of Adam's will follow. So first, I'll play Sabrina's interpretation from her debut CD uh, of the third movement from Brower's Guitar Sonata, and... Adams Valeria Asi Lo Siento Yo will follow. Thank you. 
Ay, pa' que quiera llorar Ay, pa' que quiera llorar Si ya no tengo que me oiga La que me tenía coí Y está viviendo en la gloria Y no se acuerda de mí Y está viviendo en la gloria Y no se acuerda de mí So how did you get started with the guitar? Because I know um, when you studied flamenco, you yeah. you were a gypsy uh, studying in the caves, Pretty if I'm much. correct there. Yeah. Did you, Was that your first introduction to the guitar or were you a classical guitarist before? No, I, um, you know, I lived in Malaga from the age of two to five-ish, four or five. And so before playing the guitar or anything like that, I was just surrounded by flamenco, by music. Um, we lived like, you know, Malaga is, of course, Andalusia, the south of Spain. And uh, you hear flamenco everywhere in the bars and, and wherever. My father uh, was a self-taught, is a self-taught guitarist. Uh, he started with jazz and then later on he taught himself flamenco and classical, but, you know, in a very sort of casual way, um, very intuitive. And um, so he was... Uh, my first teacher. Okay. But up until that point, I was just constantly exposed to uh, flamenco and everything. So when I was uh, seven, my pa we were in Granada and, you know, we, we met some, a whole bunch of gypsies, uh, you know. We made very good friends with a very famous uh, flamenco dancer who passed away five years ago or so, Mario Maya. And so he kind of introduced us he was sort of like a bit of a patriarch in the of the Sacromonte. The Sacromonte is what is known as the case of Sacromonte, mm -hmm. which is just down the hill from the Albaicin uh, quarters, which is the old Jewish Arabic quarters in Granada. And it's right opposite the Alhambra Palace. Yeah. So uh, the 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 main street, the main proper road that sort of engulfs the, the caves, it's called Camino del Monte. And that's where I got my stage name from. My parents just left me with a family there, a gypsy family, in a cave. And how old were you? Seven. Wow. And they disappeared for a couple of months. And when they came back, I barely recognized them. Um, they, uh, in the meantime, I learned how to swear really well. <laughs> because, <laughs> and, uh, you know... And the older brother played the guitar, the sister danced, the younger brother sang. I mean, they were all artists, Yeah, you know. And, you know, our favorite activity was just running around up and down the Camino del Monte, the, the, the main street, going into the various caves, hanging out with different, you know, musicians, artists, and whatever. Um, so that was my first introduction into this whole... I mean, not first introduction, but to, certainly in Sacromonte, in Granada. Um, but... That was a very, see, at the time we lived in Germany, but we would, my, my, my parents 
uh, would take me out of school a month before the year would end and bring me back a month after the year would begin. The next year would begin. So no wonder I was a terrible student. I, I just never understood anything. I would miss everything because I was running around with gypsies and caves all day long. Um, so th those very those three, four month long vacations, you know, became more than vacations. There was a piece of my life yeah. that really unfolded, um, you know, four months for a seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 year old kid. Every other year, every year we would go. You know, it was like a very central part of my life. And I apologize if this is a silly question, but when you're saying you're in the caves, you were living in these caves yes. as well. Yes. With yeah. uh, how, how does that work? Is it yeah, sleeping it, bags? Or? No, 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 no. They, uh, in fact, the, the family that I stayed with, the father was a pica cuevas. He was a cave maker. Okay. <laughs> you know, and he had this long pickaxe. Literally, it looked like a pickaxe from the... The, the 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 snow white and the seven dwarfs you know that <laughs> literally look just like that they're wow. very delicate work where you have to chip carefully you can't just go too you know otherwise the thing will collapse and um and so these caves are dug in into the mountain deeply into the mountain and you know you have a new baby you dig another cave <laughs> you just keep digging into the mountain and you know the caves that i would stay in you know would be what they do is they're hybrids they like they have one or two caves that are dug into the mountain and they kind of build an extension forward as well like front of the house and back of the house kind of thing hmm. kind of like a trailer with the trailer being the cave but then you can kind of create sort of an external part to the trailer so they would do the same. They would build outside of the cave as well. So it's kind of a mixture. Yeah. Oh, that's so interesting. Because I, I'm so glad you clarified that. Because as you're saying, everyone, including myself, yeah, probably yeah, yeah. thinks the word cave. And yeah, no, no, it, it's it, a high cave. Yeah. It's tall and it's all rounded up. And then they, 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 they the, the, the finish of it is cal. They use cal. I don't know how to say it in English. It's this white substance, you know, and. Um, and you know, and they decorate it beautifully with all this copper pottery and arabesque, you know, all kinds of ornaments and whatnot. And how's you know. the Wi-Fi reception? It's incredible. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. That and the running water, oh, kind of yes. on, on the same par. You know? <laughs> so, during this time, had you played the guitar? Before or is this when you first picked up? This is when guitar? I first picked up because I was surrounded by. So I was, I'm seven years old. I, I was surrounded by this, you know, constantly stimulating, and my, my my parents were like saying, "Oh, Adam, dance, dance." They just pushed me to dance, and I just didn't feel like dancing. Mm -hmm. And said, "No, I'm a singer. No, you're a dancer. No." And then I'm like, "Actually, wait, I can't even carry a tune in, a, in an armored car. What do you mean I'm a singer? I'm not a singer. I can't do any of this, you know." And then the, the, the really the key point was the key moment was. Um, I was in a guitar store in Granada, which is, you know, the famous uh, Cuesta de Gomeres, which is this road that leads to the Alhambra. Mm -hmm. It's right off. It's not at the Sacramonte. It's just down from the Sacramonte, and you kind of, you know, wind around a little bit. It's off of Plaza Nueva, which is like this main square. You go up this road, and towards, you know, halfway up there or more, on the left side is the guitar shop of who now has become like my uncle. You know, I've known this guy forever. Francisco Manuel Diaz, um, a legendary guitar builder, you know, an iconic figure in Granada and makes fantastic guitars. In fact, I have a classical guitar of his that I still play. Um, he was my parents' friend and everything. And so in his shop, uh, there was a 13-year-old boy, kid, who was playing really well. And I looked at him and I was like, man, this guy's just a little bit bigger than me but he's not quite an adult but look at him play and it just struck me as this is doable and so it made a very big impression on me and I, I still hadn't said anything so we finished our vacation we went back to home to Germany I was about to start I think third grade or something or second or third grade and I asked my dad I said hey can you teach me to play guitar and he said absolutely I said but do you think I would be able to and here, here's what he said I still remember it he says how many fingers do I have? Ten. And do I play the guitar? Yeah. How many fingers do you have? Ten. Hmm. Well, if you both have the same amount of fingers, you can do it too. I was like, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> and it was literally that moment in time I decided to be a guitarist <laughs> before I could, before I even held it properly. Yeah. You know? That was it. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> and there's mm -hmm. something, especially 
when we're younger, having this inspiration by someone around your same age. I, I was uh, uh, very fortunate. My best friend and neighbor, literal neighbor across the street, and she ended up coming to USC and mm. studied cello here with Ralph Kirschbaum. Wow. Uh, so it was just hilarious how wow. everything worked out. But she's a phenomenal cellist, wow. and she totally inspired me while growing up. It was kind of wow, you, even at a young age, people can make music like this. And there's something yeah. beautiful about that inspiration. And um, I think if there's love for the music, anyone can do it. Yeah, Definitely some people are more naturally gifted than others, of course. But if you have the drive, honestly, I think... That's the main uh, thing. As long as they're, you know, of course, it, if you don't have hands, you know, it might be a little tricky. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> but I think it, pretty much anyone can do it if they want. And it, so it was your father who really kind of started you off teaching. Yes. Did he, were you kind of learning flamenco from him or classical or Literally was it a little the, bit of the, everything? The very same day I started with both. He he started me with some solea and lagrima, hmm. like the same day. Was this all by ear? All by ear. Yeah. So even like, even classical for the first year, you know, he taught me lagrima, delita, and maybe another piece. I can't remember. I think uh, Spanish romance or something. Um, and that was all by ear and then, and of course, flamenco. And I remember just playing for six, seven hours a day. I would come home from school, throw my bag in the corner, not do my homework and just sit there and just get lost in the guitar hmm. and then go for, and, and, we, and we lived in Germany. I lived, we lived in the forest. It was like surrounded by forest. So it was forest and caves. <laughs> yeah. so, so how about a volcano or something? Yeah, right. Maybe next life. Um, you know, so after a year of, uh, of that, um, for some, you know, crazy reason, my parents and so on decided to send me off to English boarding school and, and learn classical guitar and get some proper education to counteract some of this wildness of cave dwelling and all that. So, um, they, I went to a Rudolf Steiner school, uh, you know, Waldorf schools. I don't know if you're familiar with that particular, uh, system or whatnot, but anyway, um, they, they, you know, I went off to some little, you know, kitty college, music college, you know, what's called the Wat the Watford School of Music. And I had some, you know, a guy teach me how to read, you know, from Fred Note's book. And, you know, and that was an interesting audition. I literally to audition for there. I sat on the piano and started playing some flamenco. <laughs> <laughs> on the piano? On the, I was sitting on the piano. <laughs> You know, there was no there was no chair, so I just sat on the piano. <laughs> oh, that's great. and played some flamenco for him. And says, "Okay." Um, so my dad looked at him. So, would you like to teach my son? You know, with his Romanian accent, and he's Mr. Ron's a very proper Englishman. You know, I'd be most pleased to teach your son. You know, <laughs> and you know, so he taught me how to read <laughs> and play some classical. But after two years of that, you know, my dad was like, "So the the, the problem was that the the practicing situation was not good." I couldn't practice whenever I wanted because I was in this boarding school and I had to continuously like um, be submitted to their schedules, you know, and I was used to just picking up my guitar whenever I felt like it. Yeah. So two and a half years later, my level was like nowhere where it should have been. You know, so they took me out of that. So anyway, so it was very, you know, my, my musical education and, and education in general was very, very jagged to say yeah. the least. Do you... um? One of the things that's so unique about uh, flamenco guitarists uh, is most of them don't read music right. and they only learn music by ear. Yeah. I personally, I kind of wish I grew up uh, with that style of learning uh, because I think we get so caught up in the music yeah. and it turns much more into technique instead of musicality. What What's your take on learning music by ear versus sheet music? Are, are you kind of totally... Again, she music, or do you think it's great for certain things, but it's really important to to exercise the use of our ears? No, I, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm I always people ask me yeah, this or that, and I always end up with the same answer. I, I, I'm the everything bagel, you know. <laughs> I like the everything bagel, you know, and and you know the answer is both. I yeah. mean, um, both have advantages and disadvantages, um, and it's really necessary to develop both. Um, at a young age, obviously, preferably. Um, I do believe that it's better to start off by ear. Yeah. Because when you play by ear, you're really much more connected on an intuitive level to the whole process of music making. And you're much more attentive to, to you know, your inner listening 
and and you're much more explorative, you know, and it really nourishes that explorative um, type of um, uh, instinct in you. Um, <clears throat> and of course, you know, learning music is obviously important if you want to, you know, share a universal language where you can communicate with other musicians with. I mean, that goes without saying, especially in today's world where it's, you know, crossover is is normal now. But in terms of the type of musician, the type of listening, the type of, um, the way you feel music, you know, and the way it vibrates inside you and the way it comes out, if you, you know, go by ear more so than, than your average classical musician, I think it definitely adds a, uh, a spontaneous dimension to your playing. Yeah. You know, and I have to say, I mean, flamenco musicians, guitarists especially, have ridiculous ears i have people coming up to me flamencos and say, look and they just play the cathedral and they just picked it up the entire thing they picked it up from the record you know and i mean entire pieces you know and they may have some wonky fingerings because they can't quite hear you know but there's this one guy a friend of mine an amazing guitarist enrique bermudez a sweet guy and you know his dad brought him to me once to, like you know to, to, to take some lessons in classical and whatever and uh, and I remember teaching him the cathedral and everything. Uh, and then years went by and I met him again in Madrid. And he said, Adam, th there's this piece that I wrote way back when with a really weird score to Tura, where the third string goes up to G sharp and the fourth string goes down to C sharp. So you have a perfect fifth in the middle of the guitar. It's not like your typical score that we have drop D, drop C, whatever. Yeah. It's like in the middle. And that just changes. It's, it's very, very confusing. Yeah. <laughs> and this guy figured out my score to Tura, and he transcribed by ear the entire Alegrias of mine, which, believe me, it is... I wrote it when I was 19. It is still the hardest and craziest piece I ever wrote. I think because I was, like, you know, fearless and crazy. Um, and he he transcribed the entire thing. Wow. Which is scary. Just by In ear. In score to Tura, by ear. That's crazy. You know? And... I'm sure you've done uh, things like this. I, of course, heard the stories of Paco de Lucia, you know, when he played the Aranjuez um, for that recording, you know. He just was on a beach for a month before that performance and just listened to a tape record and picked the whole concerto up. Yeah, right? actually, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry or, to bust that bubble. Or is, or is it a total BS story? I think it's a BS story. No, the truth is, is that uh, Jose Maria Guerrero del Rey spoon-fed him every single note. Oh, okay. Boom. That's a bit different. <laughs> yeah. With all due respect, you know, which doesn't diminish Paco's genius by one little bit. Um, but yeah, no, uh, Jose Maria Gallardo, you know, went there and diligently spoon fed every single note to him, which is fine. I mean, it's come on, it's Anjuez. It's not some, you know, it's not Lagrima. No, <laughs> you know. <laughs> So yeah, let's let's let, let's not let, make let, more let, mythology out of out of our gods, you know, yeah, right? either gods, but yeah. No, it's uh, there, there's a lot of these stories with pieces. I think everyone starts to accept um, certain stories, just like that. And there's of course with the Bach Chacon being the funeral piece for his wife, and that's total baloney. So yeah. I, I really appreciate you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, for for yeah, let's, out let's about not that. make more of a god of him than he already is. <laughs> it's that we've got nothing. No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, uh, speaking of compositions, you've recently completed writing um, quite an opera featuring the flamenco guitar. Can you tell me about this project? Yeah. So, um, so I wrote a flamenco opera. Um, it definitely features the guitar uh, quite a bit, more than I set out to in the beginning. <laughs> But, uh, you know, it just, it just obviously needs it. Um, not only that, it, it, you know... It became a very fascinating exercise. I mean, there's many angles to this to this you know story, but you know one particular guitar angle that would be interesting you know for us guitarists to um, to know is that I composed the entire opera from the piano. Sorry, from the guitar, not from the piano, straight into Sibelius, but from the guitar, and you know using the natural organic voicings that come from the guitar. Um, to to orchestrate hmm. everything and so what that naturally does is obviously it, it gives a very different sense of um uh 
distance, intervallic distance, and and so on. You know, in the moment of orchestration, which would run maybe counter to the, the 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 typical voicing that you would sort of, if you were a pianist, then your approach would be very different. Um, and so that whole process with a naturally tuned guitar was already interesting enough, but then I wanted to take that and put it on steroids. So I, I actually employed two different scordaturas uh, in, two, in, in three different uh, scenes. So one of the, the first scordatura, the overture, is actually based on, 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 a, um, on the, an original scordatura that I created, which is based off of the Alegrias, the first one I talked about. So third string up to G sharp, fourth string down to C sharp, and sixth string down to D. But my flamenco tonic, my Phrygian tonic, is C sharp Phrygian. Hmm. Okay? And so the harmonies coming from that scordatura are insane because it totally changes the roadmap yeah. of the guitar. And so the, the organically, you know, I mean, you have to find them. Not anything works, but you have to kind of, you know, you, you're kind of like a blind person, f you know, groping around in the dark to see what's what. And then, oh, then all of a sudden, each scordatura has its own logic and has its own universe, you know, and so much can happen within that. So taking advantage of that and blowing it up into the orchestra and just distributing that into the orchestra... Uh, created some very interesting harmonies. Yeah. You know? uh, and then the, the, there's two more scenes which are based on another score to tour, which is utterly insane, um, where I detune every single string except for the E string, the top E. And so the top E stays the same, the first string. Then the second goes up to B, sorry, up to C. Third string is G sharp. Fourth string is C sharp. Sixth, fifth string is G. And the, low, the sixth goes down to C. So it's like a, a C Phrygian tonality, but it has a very wide and broad sort of a sonority and gamut of, of, of uh, register and everything. Um, again, the, 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 just the naturally occurring harmonies and voicings coming from that scordatura, when you orchestrate that, um, just gives you very, very distinct character and color. Because voicings on the guitar are so different from traditional voicings exactly. with all these other instruments for just a standard tuning. Yes. And I can only imagine how different it is on these um, uh, tunings that you're, and ways you're inventing, which is fantastic. And I think that's one of the advantages with our instrument is there's such flexibility with these tunings. And you are talking earlier, yeah, it's a nightmare sometimes. Yes. You know, it's so easy to get tripped up, even with simpler tunings but it does sonically change everything yeah also um, the harmonic response yeah in the, the, you know within the guitar itself the overtones the, the overtones yeah completely different character of sound yeah so wow i can't wait to hear this because that, that's going to be fascinating to hear i i don't know if something's been approached quite like that orchestrating uh for at least in those types of tunings yeah. you know for not that i know of but yeah. uh yeah, we, so, you know, the, the first performance of this, I'm not calling it a premiere yet because uh, it's not the full-fledged, the full Monty in the sense with the orchestra and everything, but it will be with guitar, piano, percussion, five of the principal singers, no chorus, no dancers, at the Tucson Desert Song Festival. That'll be sort of a, a soft opening. I'm not going to use the P word, but, you know. <laughs> it's not a premiere. <laughs> it's not a Don't premiere. No. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, you know, so I'm, I'm looking forward to that. And my wife has uh, made the piano reduction of the entire opera. And so she's playing it on the piano. And it sounds good on the piano, too. So I'm very pleased. Great. <laughs> you know, all those crazy harmonies uh, actually translated into the piano. She's having a really hard time, you know, because, again, back to voicings. It's like, you know, what are these? Har she's like completely lost. Yeah. You know, there's nothing is like standard. Nothing is standard. So everything is strange, you know, but but it sounds, has a very distinct color. Everything. Yeah. And I'm assuming you're playing guitar? Yeah. What's it like um, working with? I mean, this is more of a toned down um, arrangement in regards yeah. to instrumentation, but I've, I know you've written concertos before um, and, and you've performed that with four orchestrations and everything. What's it like being in the seat of both being the composer, but also a performer? Because most premieres I've it's been horrible. to, yeah, <laughs> I, I can only imagine. Because most premieres I've been to, usually the composer works with the orchestra, but they're sitting 
at the back of the stage and listening it's, to it. It's very, I mean, it's both horrible and awesome if, if everything works right, you yeah. know? And so if you, you're lucky, if you like, you have one moment where you like can just lay back and just enjoy it because usually there's you know there's just all these battles we i mean look I, I have myself to blame you know it's just the idea of orchestrating flamenco that's just asking for trouble mm -hmm. you know I, i've been vowing for, for the last few years my next concerto is going to be a you know a classical guitar concerto where i'm not like bound by the by these rules and by the rhythmic sort of you know stringency and 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 sort of uh, rigor, the rhythmic rigor and precision that's needed in flamenco and the type of attack, just, just classical, just, you know, and, and mostly for the sake of the musicians are always suffering when they're playing my music, which, I mean, they're suffering at the beginning, but then when it comes out, they're happy because, oh, you know, but, but the challenge of rhythmically translating everything that needs to happen with the right feel and making it sound natural. Yeah is very hard. Yeah, it's got to be pretty nerve-wracking when you first start rehearsing it. Cause... You know, and it's like the first rehearsal, like, oh, my God, this is a disaster, you know? Little by little, it catches up, and then uh, uh, the answer is always, well, we're not going to be able to do it at the tempo you want. I'm like, oh, God, it's going to suck, you know? <laughs> so right away, you're like, you're, you're like, so being the composer, being the player, it's like, oh, God, you know, you want to enjoy the performance. You want to also kick back and listen and enjoy while you're hearing and, you know, and not to mention the first time you're playing something, you don't even know how it sounds. Yeah, sure, you hear it on Sibelius, but it's not the same thing. How to respond, the delay, the attack, the response, you know, there's so much happening. So much can go wrong. So much does go wrong. You have to keep on moving, you know. It's, but, you know, that's the medium I've chosen, you know. It's, this is what I am. I'm flamenco. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, and so, you know, it, I feel that I'm I'm creating this bridge into between flamenco and classical world. That that that's my life. That's who I've been. That's that's what was given to me, and that's what I have to do. It's great that we have you doing that because there there definitely is this separation where so few classical, surprisingly, so few classical guitars dive into flamenco music, and uh, you know you hear about guitarists always picking up the lute sometime, yeah. and learning that style of music and. In ways, I, I, you would, I would think it would translate much faster, you know, going between a classical guitar versus a flamenco Absolutely. guitar, as opposed to a classical guitar a and, a, and you know, a thirteen string arch lute. I, yeah. I've done that, yeah, I, and I, I was, uh, and I loved it, yeah. But I was shocked at how difficult this was. It's I different. thought it was going to be a thing where, oh, you know, I'll it's be also to, plucking, yeah, yeah. It's like, oh, it's frets, it's plucking. Yeah. I'll be yeah. able to do this is, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> whole different tuning system. Yeah. So I mean, just. I mean, Renaissance lute, you yeah, can get yeah. away with it, with right. a fast transition, but with yeah. any Baroque instruments, wow. it's just, uh, yeah, you need to dedicate your life to that. Um, Absolutely. Also, such a weird shape. It, that's the thing. Who I can, would shape an instrument as yeah. a pair? There's no way to hold it correctly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't have much of a belly, but really that belly is just of the lute or the oud, yeah. which is, you know, the lute comes from the oud, obviously. Um it just so into, anatomically, it's just not intelligent. <laughs> yeah, that's why I think the guitar won out, survived. Yeah, well, there, there's reasons why it's yes. not a popular instrument yeah, for yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Now back to your opera, just to give our listeners kind of an idea to the sure. scope of this. How how long of a work is it altogether? Altogether, I think I, you know, I, I I was constantly trimming things down. I think the original draft was like two hours and forty five minutes. Wow. And then I, you know, being kind of practical and scrutinizing and like okay how can you know people's attention span these days isn't what it used to be and i'm like okay what can what is superfluous here so i think we've trimmed it down to about two hours and 20 minutes i think that's a that's a good and what's the story with the is there a story yes uh, with the whole uh, of course there is sorry i yeah i don't know opera music too well <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So yeah, I, usually is, opera implies there's a story, a story that, <laughs> i'm used to all these random little classical guitar pieces it's yeah. like hey look at this i could do a trill with there... both the left and the right hand whoa <laughs> big deal but uh <laughs> tell me the story of your opera. i mean the story it's, it's kind of an intricate uh plot but you know the, the elevator pitch goes as follows um it is a tale about jews gypsies christians and moors at the beginning of the spanish inquisition what could possibly go wrong <laughs> 
Um, <laughs> so that's like the opener. But it's basically, it's, it's based on an anecdote that I read. So the only part of it that I read and, you know, copied, if you will, was from a book. Uh, written by a female author. I don't remember her name or the book. I read it like 20 years ago or more when I was uh, investigating uh, the connection between the Sephardic Jews and, and the Sephardic music and flamenco. So that was way back when I was kind of... So this really is opera, you know, has been a long time coming in terms of my process. You know, my process in terms of um, just just finding my roots both on a Jewish level, but also, you know, why did I end up in Spain? You know, wh why do, do I feel more identified with a Spanish culture? Don't ask me to play an Israeli song, because I don't know any. You know, mm. on an aesthetic level, I don't like Israeli music. I don't particularly like klezmer. A little bit, you know, but it's, it's, it's not what I identify with. I, it's not like my, you know, desert island music, to say the least. Um, so, you know, why all that? So that, that's been at the, at the background and at the sort of what, what's been fueling my curiosity in this matter. Um, so this anecdote from this particular book, again, you know, it's, it's very academically unsavory what I'm, the way I'm saying it, but, you know, I forgot the name of the book. Um, but the anecdote goes as follows. Once upon a time, this gypsy tribe was hit with a blood libel of, of some kind, and the Inquisition was going to impose a harsh sentence on them. So they hired a Jewish lawyer. Surprise, surprise. And um, and they even give a name. Yosef Biboldo. I could not come up with that name if you drugged me. Um, so the story goes that Biboldo managed, defended these gypsies successfully and managed to get them a reduced sentence. As a, as a thank you, as a homage to their Jewish hero, they called all the Jews Biboldos. Right? This Biboldo said so-and-so to me. This Biboldo said he'd meet me over there. So they, they would just refer to Jews as Biboldos. Okay? End of story. Um, so from that, I kind of extrapolate. Well, that's very interesting, you know, because I grew up with gypsies, and I want to know whether anything in, the, in, in history, in the past, there are connections between Jews and gypsies in Spain. And, you know, growing up in Granada and meeting all kinds of people, historians and, you know, uh, Moorish princes, which, you know, from, from Yemen and whatnot, you know, who lived in Spain and so on, who knew a great deal about the, you know, the history of Spain and the history of Granada specifically, because, you know, in, in Spain, people live their history in a very oral level, you know, um, just like the music, you know, and it's stories and passed down from generation to generation. So there have been tales of Jews and gypsies hiding in the caves of Sacromonte from the Inquisition. In fact, after, after the expulsion of the Jews of 1492, um, some Jews returned upon the penalty of death. They returned back to Spain and they hid in the caves with the gypsies and mingled with the gypsies, trying to pass themselves off as gypsies in order to not be detected by the Inquisition, mm. you know. And, and this anecdote, and th this, this sort of story that I heard 40 years ago when I was a kid and also has just been reaffirmed by somebody I met in Spain this summer who's also a, a literature teacher and a historian and so on, was relaying those stories to me. So based on, you know, all this material, all this historical material, I created, you know, characters and backdrops and motivations and whatnot. So basically the story goes, there is an evil nobleman, Don Alfonso. He is ticked off because these gypsy kids are, you know, they, they got, walked into his garden and they destroyed his garden. You know, they're kids, you know. So that was enough motivation for him to want to accuse them all and prosecute the entire tribe. But his wife, who was a kind lady, just married the wrong guy, uh, went and got a letter to Josef Biboldo, the lawyer, to try and defend them behind her husband's back. And so he is like, you know, he's sure that he's going to, you know, kill them and, you know, really win the trial. And Biboldo jumps out and all of a sudden there he appears and defends them. And he humiliates the judge in his own way. I, without getting it, there's too much detail to, you know, to count everything. But he wins the trial. And then we have a, a, a day from the trial. He then goes into, he goes to the synagogue because it's Friday night and 
we have a nice big synagogue scene. So I wanted to show like a day in the life of a Sephardic community in Spain. Hmm. And uh, so, the you know, as you well know, when we go to synagogue, before you start praying, we're chit-chatting and gossiping and how's business, how's life, how's the wife, how's this, how's that. And so there's a bit of that. There's like four different, three different or so vignettes of little personal stories. And then we go into the prayer section. And then the prayer section, well, there's a whole other story related to that, which we can touch upon in a second. Um, there's a prayer section. So during the prayer now, so Biboldo, the lawyer, has a daughter. And he and we, we hear in the, one of the vignettes, the father of this boy, you know, says, hey, my boy would like to marry your daughter. Oh, well, yeah, let's come tomorrow for Shabbos. Let's see what, you know, what my daughter says. That never happens because this gypsy boy from the tribe comes down and he's like trying to catch her attention and calls her. And, you know, this is the first time we hear flamenco singing in, in the opera up until oh, okay. then. Yeah. So he sings a petenera. Petenera is one of the, is a very ancient flamenco form. Um, and um, so they're singing this love duet in the style of petenera. And finally she sort of escapes from the synagogue and they run off to the the gypsy camp. So that, the last scene of the first act, the finale primo, is like, we, we're going from the deep spiritual world of the Jews in Spain, you know, and then we're going to the mysterious world of the gypsies in the valley, right? And so they're, this, you know, they're starting off as like, you know, they're drunk, they're happy, they're celebrating, they just want a trial, they never win, right? They're the downtrodden, they're persecuted. And so, he takes her off, they go off, but then this little gathering becomes a full-fledged flamenco ballet with orchestra and the whole shebang. So that's the first act. But then from there onwards, the whole thing deteriorates. Biboldo uh, created a, you know, he, he, uh, he did something highly illegal and treasonous to defend those gypsies, and he's found out. And so we have a, his friend who works at the king's court had a hand in helping him. His friend is a former Jew. He's a converso, so he's a crypto Jew. Uh, he's found out, he's tried for treason, he's burnt at the stake at an auto de fe. And as a result of that, Biboldo and the, 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 all the Jews and the gypsies have to escape because now the Inquisition is after them. So they escape to the only place they could, Granada, which at the time, in 1480, was the, still the only moorish enclave that was not under the catholic rule mm -hmm. so they escape to granada and they wait there and they're hiding there for 12 years granada falls in 1491 1492 was the expulsion the decree of expulsion by reina isabel la catolica was written in the alhambra um and so i use parts of the decree so finally they, they, they conquer i mean so there's basically macro and microcosm there's the macro politics of the history that we know and it gradually, it, but we have the, the, our little personal lives, our little bubble that happened in the context of the bigger history. Yeah. And so finally, the, the macro politics invade and crush the bubble of the micro world that we're seeing in, in, mm. in the personal story. So, you know, spoiler alert, you know, they're found out, they're discovered, and, you know, the gypsies get their ears cut off and the Jews are expulsed. And of course, Mariano, who is the gypsy, now becomes the husband, right? He became the husband of their child. They have a child, of course. Uh, Raquel, the daughter of Biboldo, and Mariano, the gypsy. And he's both Jewish and gypsy, because the Jewish bloodline is by the mother. The gypsy bloodline is by the, gyps by the father, hmm. via the father. And so um, at the expulsion, of course, at the last minute... He takes the child and he kidnaps him, basically, and he imposes, he, he burns his clothes, takes off his clothes, burns them, I'll tell you why in a second, and, and puts a black tunic on, on him and a big silver cross and forcibly converts him to Christianity. And that's the end of the opera. Now, the very last, so there's a few pieces of libretto that I borrow from here and there. There's some, some nasty fr Dominican friar, I forgot his name, again, my bad, a nasty Dominican friar who wrote like this horrible text about heresy and about, you know, how you, how you have to cleanse the body by burning them. And it's just sick, sick, horrible stuff. Pure inquisitional, 
you know, uh, savagery. Um, so th I, again, I use some text from that. And of course, I use some text from the uh, decree of expulsion from Queen Isabel. But the very last um, verse that the child sings goes like this. It's, it's, a, it's a verse that I've heard my whole life. And it's usually sung in the style of bulerias, which is very ironic because buleria is like the jovial, funny, sarcastic, virtuosic, happy dance, right? But here's what the verse says. Por lo judío, por lo judío, aunque me quemen la ropa, no reniego de lo que sío. Translated means, for the sake of the Jews, for the sake of the Jews, even if they burn my clothes, I will not negate or deny who I am, hmm. who I've been, okay? Where the hell does this come from? Where does this, where do, where do those lyrics come from? You get these gypsies who don't know how to read the newspaper, let alone music or anything else, and they're singing, again, case in point, oral history, Yeah, you know? And so that is, you know, a very, again, I'm not going to say proof, because the word proof obviously, you know, <laughs> obliges all kinds of scientific standards, but it's certainly a smoking gun to the a testament of, you know, Jews and gypsies mingling at some point, you know, in history. Yeah. So anyway, sorry for that long-winded answer. Oh, but... <laughs> no, no, don't be sorry at all. It's fantastic to to hear how much of an arc and the, the story it must be, must have been quite emotional uh, writing that at, at some points. Um, and it just... I, I just can't imagine um, the amount of work and dedication that must go into a composition like this with everything, figuring out these scordatoros, um, orchestrating, voicing for all these instruments, along with developing such a complex and meaningful story and the lyrics and everything. I know you're, you have quotes, uh, but of course, a lot of it, I'm sure, is your writing. I, I yeah. just... That it probably took quite a while. Well, or did you just kind of sit down and you know, write it one you summer? Know, I, I, you know, it's like I'm always, you know, my wife says, never say this and never say that. But I'm just going to say the truth. Um, and I don't mean that in any way that's, you know, bragging or, or whatever. And again, yes, it was a lot of work. But, you know, um, what, I'm, what I'm trying to say is, I, I, first of all, I'm not a librettist. Okay, I, I, I write pretty averagely down, you know, poorly and full of mistakes. And, you know, I, again, I, I've had very um, inconsistent schooling. So and in, in four different languages. So, you know, I'm pretty confused when it comes to like anything proper. Okay. What I do have is, is, is stories to tell. And I've lived life you know, I live life in a very visceral and experiential way, not, an not only in an intellectual way but in an experiential way. And so that was at the driving, uh, that, that was the driving force that, that, that initiated this. My original plan was, you know, to come up with a story. I had the outline of the story, but then to act, when the, where the rubber hits the road, okay, what is he going to say? Who the hell is this guy? What's his, how, how is this character going to develop later? What's going to, you know, all this, that's a craft, which I do not have. But I do happen to have a good friend who is a, she's the daughter of La Chana, who is a world-renowned, I mean, one of the greats, iconic flamenco dancers. Uh, in fact, she was featured in, in a movie by Peter Sellers, like the original Peter Sellers, the director from the 60s and 50s. Mm. And the movie's called El Bobo, literally like that. But is there an English term? No, it's called El Bobo. It's just pronounced with an American accent. El Bobo. Huh. And there's a whole scene of La Chana when she was 19 dancing. It's like probably one of the longest, most impressive flamenco dance scenes in a Hollywood movie, you know? Yeah. So her daughter, so I'm very close to La Chana. I met La Chana first. Then I met her daughter. Her daughter happens to be the first gypsy female novelist. She wrote a book about, you ready for this? Gustav Mahler. A fictional novel about Mahler. Okay. Um, viewed through the eyes of a gypsy girl that he was very close to. So, so, so there's like, there's this very blurry line between real history and this fictional character she created. Yeah. Brilliant. 
it got it's her first novel the first draft was 1500 pages she narrowed it down to 800 um and what's the name of this book or novel yeah it's called el, el angel de maler okay el angel de maler um nuria santiago is the, is the name of the daughter we've since she's like become my sister um you know needless to say her spanish and her you know proficiency and skill level of writing is off the charts so the I- original idea was look i don't know how to write so y- you're gonna write the libretto and she's like am i well yeah you're the writer you're the gypsy <laughs> you're the writer no and so you know we're like back and forth but the you know, phone calls would have been way too expensive she unfortunately was in a very bad connection with so skype wasn't happening and says you know what this isn't gonna ha- this isn't gonna work you know we have to have like clear co- communication so you know what Here's what's going to happen. I'm going to start, because I, I just had this itching in me. I just had to, like, it was just building up in me, you know? Mm-hmm. I was like, you know what? Screw it. I'm just going to start writing this thing. All wrong, all bad. You can correct all my spelling mistakes, all my grammar, whatever. But I feel this narrative brewing in my head. It's just happening. Boom, boom, boom. Of course, my wife, who's Argentinian, obviously, you know, she helped considerably. So between the two of them, they kind of set me straight. You, know, you can't say that. What you, you know, they were like laughing. But the story and the substance and the the dialogue and the back and forth, all that, you know, I was just like in my room, prancing around, acting it out, talking it, saying it, writing it as it was just coming to me, you know. Yeah. I'm living this. I'm living it, you know. And so I wrote the libretto of the first act in about a, a month and a half, six to seven weeks. And then I started writing the music. So I'm writing, so, you know, all in all, it took two and a half years of libretto. And, you know, we obviously pauses. Sometimes I would, you know, go on tour, do this, do that. You know, it takes two, three months break and then come back to it and so on. But, you know, people, it's funny. Everyone always says, oh, there's so much work. It's so much work. I missed that time. It was literally, I was on a high. I was on a permanent high <laughs> while I, mean, I was writing it. Because you wrote that, you just went for it. I just went so for it. inspired. You know, I was inspired and, and I was just driven by this need to, 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 to hear something that doesn't exist, you know. And, and there was a bit of fear because, you know, who do I model? Well, I don't know. It does, you know, there isn't such a thing as a flamenco opera yet. I don't know who to model. So, I mean, sure. Actually, funnily enough, um, again, no shortage of irony here. Right before starting to write my opera, I went to see, I, I went with my wife to the Met and we saw The Ring. So I missed the first one, but we, we started with Siegfried and I'd never seen Wagner before. And of course, you know, had plenty of prejudice against Wagner because I'd never seen it properly. I just heard little bits and pieces and you, you cannot listen to Wagner just the little bits and pieces. It's either you're fully present or don't even bother. Okay. You know? Uh, but not to mention that, plus obviously all the you know anti-Semitic prejudices and so on and so forth that I was that I grew up on and that we all grew up on. So you know my, my opinion of him was not very high to say the least. I go there, I sit down, and the whole thing starts, and I'm just captivated. It just mm. blew my mind. It was amazing. Just amazing how he t- just loved how he took time and how this and how that and everything, everything just sat right. And, and just, I mean, the whole thing just made such an impression on me. And as I'm watching Wagner, I'm literally instantly translating everything into flamenco potential. Oh, this could be this and this could be that. Like instant translation. Oh, I, oh, I could do this. Oh, I could do that, but like this. <laughs> and so this <laughs> simultaneous, my, I'm like seeing this, but this could really be this, you know. And, um, and so, you know, and I was like, okay, so this made such an impact on me. So we were just supposed to go and see Siegfried. I'm like, I want to know what happens next. I'm going for the next one. I'm, you know, so I just bought more the uh, tickets for the other two, you know, um, you know, Valkyrie and the, and the Gotha Demerung and everything. And I was just, you know, and then after that, I started writing my opera, you know, so that, that was like the lesson. Okay. This is how you do it. Okay. You just kind of do that. But with this, you know, and, you know, I have to say this, it's actually when you have, when you're writing to text, 
the musical ideas come much easier than when not. I spent six to nine months tweaking my bulerias, which is just a solo guitar piece. Um, tweaking that, which is like a six, seven minute guitar piece, took me longer than writing an entire act of opera. Wow. <laughs> I don't know why. And I, you know, and I think because I didn't do it before and I, it, I was just fearless. It, it was just, I don't know. I mean, let's, let's, let's back this up. I had my wife who is an opera conductor coach. She's the pro. She was checking up on me, making sure I wasn't doing whatever bullshit. You know, she was like, I said, honey, this is dumb. You know, but that happened only in a couple of occasions. But, you know, she's like, no, this is not happening, you know. But everything else, she just gave me the green light. Yeah, this sounds right. Yeah, okay. Maybe you want to think. Yeah, she just kind of pointed me in a couple directions yeah. on occasion. But, I mean. It must have been so useful. It was. Yeah. It was. And, and you know, knowing that she's in my corner kind of gave me that confidence to be more fearless and just go for it, you know? And yeah. Because <laughs> writing um, music for solo guitar or any solo instrument where it's uh, been written for extensively in ways it's very nerve wracking because it's kind of how do I make a statement that's different from someone else's statement? Yeah. It is very tough to do. Yeah. yeah. It, it's very tough to do that with things that aren't as common, but I, I could totally see what you mean where it's this has never been done before how about i just write yeah. what i feel yeah and um when, when is this uh not the p word but when is this uh yeah, uh, yeah. performance yeah performance when is this performance it's um, january 30th january 30th of 2019 in tucson yes yeah i i'm i, I have a feeling it's going to be very well received and i think it's uh really an exciting endeavor and something we don't have in this world. Not only um, we, there's no such thing as a flamenco opera in ways before you wrote this there, there's uh, also, I I'm sure guitars utilized in some operas, but it's really exciting to, to know that the instrument is yeah. finally going to be featured in a way that, Thought provoking, right? In an opera, in an opera, exactly. Yeah. Not only feature, but really kind of holding it together, yeah. almost. Because I, I mean, I've heard. Um, yeah. Remind me, what was the name of that? Ina Demar. Ina Demar. Yeah, that it's a it's a great opera. Yes. And remind me the composer. Uh, uh, Golikov, Osvaldo Golikov. It's fantastic. Yeah, it's really fun that there's guitar, but you know, there's a there's a couple little guitar licks, but yeah, it just seems like it's a little trick, and then in ways. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's maybe really not a trick, but it, it's color. Seems, it, it's more of a textural thing. Textural, not a ton of substance. Yeah, uh, fun to do. I mean, I, I, again, I have to also acknowledge the fact that that was a great training ground um, for me to, you know, it, it was a good precursor. It was a good school. You know, again, I, I did not study composition. I did not study orchestration. But sitting in sixty performances of Ina Damar. In the environment where you you literally get to, you know, today I'm going to focus on the timpani. <laughs> yeah. Today I'm going to focus on the viola. You know, today I'm going to focus on the trumpet. Just what is he exactly? I mean, just that. You know, yeah. I had the luxury of doing that. And oh, and how is he doing this? Okay, and what's the register? That oh, now all of a sudden the piano comes in here and the and the, and, the, and the celeste is doing. Oh, okay. You know, I mean, you're you're seeing in in real time. You're like for me, I took it as a orchestration composition lesson yeah you know it's just being soaked in that soup marinating in this environment eventually you know i mean it's thanks to that that I eventually obviously it got me to writing my own opera because um you know the way it happened was osvaldo one day calls me up and says adam they're gonna do my piece in argentina and la plata where i was born please, can you go? I'm like, dude, you don't have to convince me, man. I'm up for any adventure. <laughs> he was like begging, please, if you don't go, it'll be a disaster. I'm like, look, it's not going to be a disaster. You don't have to convince me. I'm going. So I go there. And of course I land. And the first day I land, it was a disaster. Uh, the roads were blocked. There was no electricity. There was no running water. I was like, yeah, welcome to the third world. You know, that got fixed up pretty quickly. So, um, uh, you know, and that's where I met my, my future wife. That's where I met Mercedes. You know, she was the preparer of that opera. 
you know, mm. and she was the coach, you know, and, and repertorist, uh, repetitor for, for that particular opera. And so that's how we met. And then we started dating. And then like on the second or third visit down there, she one day just said, honey, have you ever thought of writing an opera? And she kind of gave me that look where if I said no, it'd be a bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, yeah, sure. Of oh, course. really? <laughs> what? I'm so, so I kind of on my feet, I literally improvised sort of a very brief synopsis of the very lengthy story I told a minute ago. Not with that much detail, but I kind of said, yeah, this and this and that. And then they're expulsed. And she's like, ay, que lindo. I'm like, oh, come on. Yes, no. Yeah. So after half an hour of haggling, yes, good idea, no good idea. Because if I say yes, I'm all in. I can't just say yes and then flake out. So when I said yes, I'm like, oh, God. And it, What have I gotten myself uh, yes. into? <laughs> and, you know, and I, that, that's when I knew that I was, I was beginning a new chapter in my life. <laughs> Thank you, Adam, for being on the show. Please join me in two weeks for a conversation with the San Francisco Conservatory of Music professor, Mark Teichelts. For our Tucson listeners, I highly encourage heading over to the Tucson Desert Song Festival on January 30th at the University of Arizona for the first performance of Adam's Opera. We'll finish things today uh, with a preview. This is the aria of Biboldo. And of course, it's Adam playing on the guitar. The orchestral uh, recordings are actually samples that were just made in the box or within a computer program. And they actually sound phenomenal for what they are, but I can only imagine how great this piece is going to sound with the true orchestration. I'm David Steinhardt. We'll see you next time for the Tone Bass Classical Guitar Podcast. Oh!
portada. 